Hi everybody, Physics Ninja. Today we're going to look at the magnetic field produced by a circular loop at a point that's above the plane of the loop. Okay, so I have it illustrated here on the side. I'm going to look at a point P which is still in the center of the loop, just a certain distance, some uh, height above uh, the plane of the loop. Okay, we're going to integrate the Biot-Savart law and try to find what the total magnetic field is. Again, we're going to try to simplify it as much as possible. Right? Whenever you can use symmetry of a problem to make the calculation simpler, you should try to do that. I recently did the square loop, the same problem, just with a different geometry. That case is actually a little bit more complicated than this one because some elements of the square loop are farther away from the point of observation. In this case, because of uh, the geometry, all those points on the circle are always the same distance from the point P. That makes the integral in the Biot-Savart much easier. So let's go see how we do that. Uh, again, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, consider subscribing to my channel and leave a comment or question if you have any. All right, let's get started. All right, I want to first find what is the small element of field produced by this little green segment of current over here. Okay, so this little element of current is kind of going into the page or along this uh, negative x direction, it looks like, just from this diagram. A couple of the vectors over here, we have vectors that are going to go from the origin all the way to the edge. Okay, that's my r prime vector. I also have a vector that goes to the point of observation, and that's going to be a distance z away from the plane. Uh, the radius of this loop is r. Now, it's kind of important to have a clear diagram here uh, because we want to really simplify this term. All right, first thing, let's look at the direction of this little field produced by this small element. Uh, first of all, this is a cross product. So any vector that results from a cross product has to be perpendicular to both of these. Here's r minus r prime, and here's dl. Well, a vector that's perpendicular to both of those should look something like this. This should be the direction of the little element of magnetic field over here, produced just by this guy. We then have to look at all the contributions from every little segment going around that loop. What that's going to do is basically, if I look at different ones, it's basically going to trace out a cone. If I go ahead and I look at the small element over here, that would produce a small magnetic field that looks in this direction over here. Okay. Um, so let's first write down just what the magnitude of this vector is. Okay. If I'm only interested in the magnitude, um, then it would look something like this. Okay, the magnitude of this vector dB, again, it's mu zero over four pi. Now to eliminate this cross product, again, it's I dL, it's the magnitude of each vector, uh, multiplied by R minus R prime. Uh, the magnitude of this, let's get rid of this. Let's write it as a magnitude. And divided by, again, uh, R minus R prime. And this is still cube. Okay, now that's the magnitude of this vector. So you notice here I can get rid of that. I can also get rid of one at the bottom. Let's not forget this other line here just to denote the magnitude. All right, and now we can clean this up. And really the last expression I have here is mu naught over four pi, um, the magnitude of IDL, and divided by uh, the magnitude of R minus R prime. So it's kind of what is the length of this vector right here that goes from the edge all the way to the point of observation. And it's going to be that value. Let's go back to black. R minus R prime uh, squared. All right, and we know the direction just from the diagram over here. All right, let's work on this length of the vector since that appears here in the denominator. The nice thing about it is that any little element of current that I consider, it's always going to be the same distance away from the point of observation. So this right here is actually going to be a constant for this problem. So that's kind of nice. So let's go ahead and just work on this one. What is the magnitude of r minus r prime? Okay, and you can start with it squared. So all you have to use is Pythagorean theorem, right? So the distance of basically the length of the hypotenuse here, it's going to be r squared, the radius squared, and multiply uh, plus z squared. It should simply look something like this, r squared plus z squared. All right, we can go ahead and substitute into the magnitude of my small element of magnetic field. So again, you have mu zero over four pi. 
uh, IDL and divided by, again, now this whole term just goes at the bottom here, R squared plus Z squared. Now I'll put a bracket around that term. Okay, let's go work with DL now. What is the length of DL? So we're looking at a small element of arc on the circle. Okay? So the element uh, has a length L of, sorry, the length of this element DL is the radius multiplied by a little bit of angle here, right? A little bit of angle, I'm going to call that D phi, right? And D phi is simply a small amount of angle over here. Okay, and this is basically what I'm going to be integrating over uh, in just a minute. I'm not quite done here, but we can go ahead and do one extra step of the math. 4 pi i. Okay, dl now I'm going to substitute by its length, which is the radius of the loop multiplied by d phi. And again, all of this gets divided by this constant, which is r squared plus z squared. All right, now I'm not done. Now remember, this is only going to give me what is the magnitude of... Let me go ahead and highlight it right here. It only gives me the magnitude of this. Now, when I start adding up all the different contributions, for example, when I include this one over here, when I include this one, I have to sum over all of them. They give me vectors in different directions, right? You could see, right? The one on the right-hand side gives me a vector that points in this direction. The one on the left-hand side of the loop gives me a vector that points in this direction. Really, what I really want at the end is... I want a vector that's going to only include the Z component of all of those vectors, okay? So let me go ahead and write that. Really what I want here is actually, what is the Z component of this vector? And then I'm gonna add up all of the Z components. Let me show you what that looks like. All right, so here's kind of the Y direction. Just draw another set of coordinate systems here. Uh, the Z direction is this one right here. And again, I'm going to break this vector down into two components, right? The DB vector here has a component along the Y axis. I'm going to call this DBY. Um, and the vertical component, this is really what I want right here. This is the Z component of this green vector over here. Okay. And what I want to do now is I want to sum up all of those because that's going to give me the total field. You notice that all of the components in the y direction or all of the components um, that are in the plane are always going to cancel out, right? Imagine you go on the other side and you break this green vector down into two components. It's going to have a component in the plane, which we're calling dby, and it also has a vertical component. Again, I'll do that one in purple, right? This here is the vertical component of the one on the left. At the end, all of the Y components are going to cancel out because you're integrating over a loop. The only thing that's left is going to be Z components. All right, so let's go back then. So how would I write the Z component? Well, I have to define an angle here somewhere. Yeah. I think probably the best one to define is maybe this one right here. Imagine I call this angle here theta. Okay. Um, if I call this angle theta, you'll have to just convince yourself, maybe draw another diagram. Uh, again, we have a 90 degree angle over here. So that means that this angle right here must also be theta. And this one's kind of useful because now you can relate it to uh, the Z component. So this is what it looks like if I zoom in over here. I kind of have the uh, vector dB. What I'm going to have now is a Z component, which is what I really want to look for. Because all the other components are going to cancel. And if I just draw just a system of axes here, here's the y-axis. Uh, the angle theta that I've defined is actually this one right here. It's the same angle that appears inside this triangle right here. All right, so putting this all together, that means that the z component is going to be the magnitude of dB multiplied by sine of theta. All right, let's put it all together now. So we have all of this term, which is our dB length. I R D phi and divided by R squared plus Z squared. And now I need to put what sine of theta is. How can I define sine of theta? Well, if you use this triangle right here, sine of theta, again, just using some trigonometry, sine of theta is the opposite, which is the radius of that loop divided by 
the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is basically the magnitude or the length of r minus r prime, which is related to this, right? So it should just look like this, r squared plus z squared, but it's just the magnitude of it. So it's really to the one half or the square root of that. Okay, so this is actually uh, super important for this problem over here because we really only want to pick up one component of that field. So let's go ahead now and write down the sine of the angle theta. Sine of the angle theta is r, and r squared plus z squared, and this whole thing here is to the one half. All right, and now the last step what we're gonna do now is just take this last expression and do the integration. So let's go to the next slide and finish this problem off. All right, so the last step now is what we wanna get now is the total field in the z direction. Let's just write it as total. Okay. So what we wanna do now is we wanna integrate all of the small components of the z components of each individual segment, okay? And our uh, variable for integration is the angle, and the angle is gonna go from zero all the way to two pi. Okay, so we really wanna do something like this. And now we're basically just substituting all of these terms. What you gotta do now is you simply gotta take out all the constant terms, and there's a whole bunch of them, right? Well, let's start. Let's go with mu zero. Let's go over with four pi, that's a constant. Uh, the current in the loop is a constant. I also have an r here, and I have another r right here, that turns into r squared. So let's just simplify this. This is i, this is r squared. I'm going to have a term in the denominator. Uh, both of these terms are the same. They have different exponents, right? Uh, this guy is, is one, and this guy is one half, so that means you're gonna have a term that looks like r squared plus z squared, and this is going to be to the three halves. And the last part, I still have my integration from zero to two pi, and all I have is d phi, right? So this is super easy, because this here is simply equal to two pi, right? That's all I'm doing. Just simply adding all these little bits of angle over one full circle, that equals to two pi. All right, we're almost done. I think I could finish this off in one step, uh, b total. You see that the two pi that I'm gonna get here in red is going to cancel a little bit, right? The pi's are going to cancel out. Let's just go ahead with that. And also I'm gonna have two, and I have a four down here, so let me cancel that out, cancel this two, and I'm gonna be left with another two down here. All right, and the final, final expression now, um, mu naught over two, uh, i, r squared, then this kind of big fracture, or big term down here, r squared plus z squared, and all this is to the three halves. Man, quite a bit of work, but actually a little bit less than the square loop. Square loop's a little bit harder than this one. One thing you should always check, well, what happens now if my point, if it wasn't up here, right? What if it wasn't some distance z? You can see that as z gets bigger, this field is going to get smaller, right? But what happens now if my point was right here? We could check. What does the answer boil down to? In this case here, this would mean that the z would be equal to zero. All right, my z component for the total magnetic field, it really only has a z component. All you have to do now is we're setting z equal to zero. Uh, you can see over here you have r squared. Once I set z equals to zero, I'm gonna be left with an r cubed here in the denominator. So that means that the final expression simply over two r, and that one is a standard kind of textbook problem. Uh, usually they give that result for a loop at the center of a loop. Center of a loop. All right, folks, anyway, that's it. That's the whole problem. Uh, this is not that bad. I think you, you really, this is not the clearest diagram, but hopefully yours is a little bit better than mine. I think once you have this green vector here for that small element of field, uh, at the end you have to argue that it's really only going to be a Z component at the end of the day. Um, and that where that's how we introduce this uh, angular term for sine of theta, okay? Only to go grab that component that is along the Z axis. All right, that's it for me, folks. Thanks for watching.